thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, I'm Gavin Kleespies. I'm the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, it's great to see such a full house. Um, I believe this may actually be one of the largest groups we've had since about 2020. Um, I also know that we're joined online by uh, about 150 people, so it's a, a great turnout this evening. Uh, this evening, we will explore the Boston neighborhood of Little Syria uh, with Chloe uh, Bordewick and Lydia Harrington. Uh, Dr. Bordewick is a postdoctorate associate in public history at Boston University. She received her PhD in modern Middle Eastern history from Harvard University in 2022. Uh, Dr. Harrington is a postdoctoral fellow at the Aga Khan Program for Islamic Architecture at MIT. Uh, she received her PhD in architectural history from Boston University also in 2022. Uh, they, uh, in a few minutes, will be joined uh, by a group of people who will share their memories of Little Syria, uh, and uh, I will allow them to introduce the, the panelists who will be joining us shortly. For anyone who may be joining the Mass Historical Society for the first time, I want to extend a, a special welcome to you. Uh, we, the Mass Historical Society, have been uh, collecting and preserving uh, the history of Massachusetts and the nation for the past 232 years. Uh, we're the first historical society in America, uh, dating back to 1791. As I like to point out, uh, when we were founded, our, our founder, Jeremy Belknap, uh, wrote to Paul Revere, and Paul Revere wrote back. Uh, so. <laughs> Um, we maintain a, a research library with an amazing collection of material. Uh, we have close to 14 million manuscript pages in our collection. Uh, we make this material available to researchers, whether they're academic, uh, students, uh, or just members of the public. Uh, it's available for free to anyone who's interested in using it. Um, and we also host a, a wide variety of programs like the event this evening. Uh, we're only able to host programs like these thanks to the support of our members and donors. So I hope you'll return for future programs, and I hope if you enjoy this program and future programs, you'll consider becoming a member of MHS uh, or supporting us uh, in another way. So without further ado, I'm happy to turn it over to, uh, to Chloe and Lydia. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gavin. It's really great and gratifying to have such a big crowd here tonight and to everyone online um, as well. We just wanted to say um, happy Arab American Heritage Month, happy Eid, happy uh, Easter, uh, et cetera. So if you've wandered down Shamut Avenue in recent years, uh, you've probably noticed this bold yellow sign of the Sahara uh, restaurant hanging over a shuttered Greek, uh, brick Greek revival building. Uh, this is one of the few visible traces of the Syrian community that first settled Boston in the late 1880s. Uh, and today we'll be taking you on a walk through the past and present of the neighborhood, uh, the neighborhoods where this community was concentrated. Now Chinatown and a slice of the South End. Uh, as uh, Gavin said, I'm Chloe Bordewick, a postdoc associate in public history at BU. Uh, and I'm Lydia Harrington, a postdoctoral fellow in Islamic architecture at MIT. Uh, so we're the co-founders of this Boston Little Syria project, a public history initiative that aims to bring light to an integral piece of the city's history that's often overlooked. Um, so the format of tonight's event is going to be um, basically us just talking for a few minutes about uh, how Boston's early Syrian community fits into longer histories of immigration and urban change. Namely, how did Syrians inhabit Boston's urban spaces, and how did their presence shape the city, and how did the city's transformation shape the community? Then we'll move on to three panelists who have roots in the community who will share their family history, and we'll open it up at the end to discussion and a Q&A with the audience. And we just want to thank a few people who have given enormous support to our project, such as the Abdullahid family, Father Timothy Ferguson, Rich Fanoni, Ed Malouf, Richard Shibley, Mary Najimi, Nick Haddad, Gavin Klepsis, Peter Drummy, Olivia Saya, Ian Spangler, Garrett Dash Nelson, Bashir Amin, Guy Rossman, Kai Alexis Smith, Yorgos Ephthimiadis, and everyone else who contributed to this project. Uh, apologies if we have left anyone out. Um, and thank you all for showing up uh, in person, and also hi to everyone online. Thank you for coming. Okay, so this project started uh, last year, actually started before COVID, and then we had to delay a little bit, but we got back on track last year 
um, with walking tours of the neighborhood. And this turned into an exhibition at MIT last fall through the winter. And we brought the exhibition here, which you saw upstairs. So we also are incorporating material culture um, into the project. So if you looked at uh, 20th century Boston, entire neighborhoods have been wiped out, such as the West End, which had a Syrian and Lebanese population. Other neighborhoods um, are under threat from development, like Chinatown still is. Um, so that's one reason we wanted to preserve this history, as well as um, we see it as a way to combat anti-Arab sentiment and promote an understanding of how Arabic-speaking peoples have been a, party, a part of this city's history. In fact, since the very beginning, and before the beginning of the United States, for example, when Nathan Bedin, a young uh, teenager from Syria, uh, fought uh, in the Revolutionary War and died uh, in the Battle of Boston. Where, when, and who are we talking about when we talk about Little Syria? This is a map from a 1911 uh, report called the Dillingham Commission Report. And on this map, we can see a range of the different ethnic groups that um, were settled in Boston at the turn of the 20th century. Now, this map is interesting, actually, because it was created by a commission whose goal was to advocate the further restriction of immigration at a point when this was in American history, when, um, uh, w w when this was kind of a <clears throat> hotly, hotly contested issue. Um, and in fact, uh, Syrians were at the center of these debates over who should and shouldn't be allowed in. Um, were Syrians white enough to assimilate, in the words of, of the uh, immigration officials at the time? Could they be considered American? Could they be naturalized or not? Um, ultimately, in 1915, after a series of court cases, um, a, a Syrian named George Dow in South Carolina uh, was able successfully to uh, convince the courts that he was in fact white and therefore should be uh, naturalized. And that, uh, that from that point forward, uh, people of Middle Eastern and North African origin were considered white for the purposes of the census, for, for instance. Now that's being contested again. That did not, though, include Muslim immigrants. And I think people often ask, well, are we who are we talking about when we talk about the Syrians who settled this neighborhood? And uh, in this case, it was almost entirely a Christian population. And that was a really significant factor in how people thought about the assimilability uh, of, of the Syrians into um, US society. And that really didn't change until the middle of the 20th century series of cases in the 1940s and in changes to, to immigration law in the 60s, which permitted a much uh, more diverse uh, demographic uh, of immigrants from the Middle East and North Africa. So again, where are we talking about and when are we talking about when we talk about this neighborhood? The first major cluster of people uh, from Syria to settle uh, in Boston settled in uh, around uh, what's now called Ping On Alley, what was in the 1880s Oliver Place, uh, just off of Beach Street, um, and then primarily on Hudson and Tyler Streets in what's today Chinatown. Uh, the second, and if you saw the maps upstairs, you can probably visualize this. You have two separate maps. Uh, as by the 1920s, this population had moved increasingly across what's now I-90 uh, down Shawmut Avenue. So those are the two parts of the neighborhood, um, and we're talking about the period from the late 1880s through roughly the 1960s. So we'll look at another map now, um, just to situate ourselves of where people are coming. So um, obviously, present-day Syria doesn't really line up with uh, greater historic Syria, which included uh, what is now Syria and Lebanon, Israel, Palestine. And most people are coming from Beirut, uh, from Mount Lebanon, the mountainous region around Beirut, um, other Lebanese villages, as well as um, Aleppo and Damascus. Uh, by 1920, there were over 3,000 Syrians in Boston. It was the third largest population uh, of Arabs, or sorry, of Syrians in the U.S. after New York City and Detroit. Um, Lawrence, uh, Massachusetts was close behind. Also, you had a significant population in Worcester. And just to briefly say why they came, first from religious persecution, and then uh, the, a very large reason became um, economic, uh, like increasing their economic opportunities due to the decline of the silk industry in um, Lebanon and Syria. That was a very, uh, a very large reason. And then also during World War I, to avoid conscription into the Ottoman army. Um, and we can also think about 
uh, a larger network of people in Ottoman Boston, so people coming um, from Armenia, from or Armenians coming from Turkey and from Syria, uh, as well as Albanians, Greeks, um, and other people in the region coming to Boston, um, and also Syrians and Lebanese uh, settling all over New England, such as in the cities I mentioned, also the Merrimack Valley, Waterville, Maine, uh, Fall River, Massachusetts, and Northern Rhode Island, as well as Western Mass uh, cities like Pittsfield. So you really have uh, a lot of different uh, people connected, as well as connected to larger areas um, across uh, North and South America, Rio de Janeiro, Havana, Mexico City, as well as other cities across the US. And people were very mobile, going back and forth between different cities, as well as going back to the homeland in Syria. Now we'll show a photo that you might have seen. This is one of the uh, most common photos you might might, might have seen shared. Um, so we're gonna just take you on a few sites from the tour briefly, um, and we encourage you to walk the neighborhood yourself um, if you have a chance and haven't been there yet. Um, so Syrians came and um, you know, lived in tenement apartments with one, you know, one shared bathroom uh, in what's now Chinatown and then and gradually moved down to the south end. Um, you can see here women are practicing uh, making lace, which was a common, um, craft that they had learned back in Syria. The man smoking hookah, maybe he just got off work relaxing on the stoop. So the streets were very, you know, lively, had people who were, you know, maybe celebrating a wedding or some, an important occasion like that and playing music in the streets. Um, also a common uh, employment for people when they just arrived was to engage in peddling. So selling um, dry goods from a little cart on the street something you could uh, take up really quickly when you got here, even if you didn't know English uh, right away. So when we're talking about labor and commerce, uh, economic life in little Syria, um, one of the ways that uh, Lydia and I have gone about researching this uh, uh, is by looking at old newspapers. And there were, in fact, a couple of Arabic newspapers that were published uh, in and around Boston uh, in the early 20th century. So here are a couple of ads we found that uh, speak to businesses that existed uh, in, in the neighborhood. So I'll just quickly look here. Uh, over on the right, um, we have an ad for Arax Grocery, uh, which is, was run by an Armenian named Michael Ajamian. Uh, that was at 30 Neyland Street. Um, and his business uh, was a grocery, very common, uh, very common occupation also for Syrians, running a small grocery on the uh, bottom floor of a tenement building. Um, and in this case, uh, he's also advertising, this is one reason why we love this ad, he's also advertising uh, music. So in this case, uh, he was selling the latest uh, records uh, straight from the Middle East, from Egypt. Uh, in this case, the, uh, the Egyptian singer, Sheikh Salama Higazi. So anyways, there's, there you can mine quite a bit from these ads. On the left, we have um, a, an advertisement from Fatat Boston, which was an Arabic language paper published uh, right on Tyler Street, beginning in 1914. And this is an advertisement for, yeah, Castle Furniture Company on 793 Washington Street. So as you can, you can get a sense of what sort of goods uh, they had on offer there. Now, just to say one more thing about newspapers and printing and publishing, um, Fatat Boston, uh, well, Fatat was published in Lawrence, actually, but Fatat Boston was, as I said, on Tyler Street. And uh, its founder, Wadia Shaker, who uh, had come from Lebanon um, with, as a teenager to Boston, he came to Boston saying that he had heard it was the literary capital of America. And so he got here and found, like, oh, well, it might be the literary capital, but they don't have an Arabic newspaper yet. And uh, so he started one. And one of the most interesting periods, I mean, for uh, intellectual and political life in the neighborhood was the world period of World War I. So uh, during the war, as Lydia mentioned, uh, many people came to Boston during the war to flee conscription into the Ottoman army. But those who were here were also debating the political issues of their day, which were urgent and important. So in this case, in Fatah, uh, Boston, we see debates over what the future should be of the uh, collapsing Ottoman Empire, for example. Um, what, should, uh, what should Syrians in the diaspora, um, what kind of future should, there, should they 
uh, support? Um, should they support a mandate, et cetera? So this is a moment of, of political ferment. We're going to uh, move on now from political and intellectual life to uh, the uh, education uh, in Little Syria. Okay, so another site we stopped on on the tour um, was designed by architect uh, Gridley J.F. Bryant uh, and opened in 1847, the Quincy Grammar School. Quincy School also exists in a slightly different location now since it moved. Um, and he designed this in Greek Revival style, so going back you know, to that, um, de those democratic origins of Greece and of, of, of Boston and the U.S. that he wanted to emphasize. And unfortunately, you know, it looks pretty different today because uh, it unfortunately suffered a fire um, in the 1850s and then a hurricane took off the roof in 1938 so it was rebuilt um, with a flat roof um, and it's uh, yeah so it looks pretty different um, uh, but it was very important in the history of not just little Syria but also US educational history and educational reform it was the first site in the US um, of the transition from the double-headed to single-headed school system, so where we see children divided into grades and taught by a single teacher in, a, in a, their own special classroom. Um, in addition to that, you know, you had Syrian students learning alongside Chinese students, Italian, Jewish, Irish um, students, and, you know, uh, we heard in one oral history, you know, uh, one woman saying we knew so many kids of different backgrounds, we could swear in 10 languages. So they <laughs> learned some not so savory things in, in school, but um, it was a place for them to you know, learn English and learn American civic values, and um, as well as you know, learn, learn from children of different backgrounds. And um, also adults uh, would take night classes there, adults of all different backgrounds, um, and also learn English. Um, at the same time. So I think we can move to the next one. Yeah. yeah. Um, so right around this, we're talking about a cluster of streets here, right around Hudson and Tyler Street. And um, right on those streets, you could, uh, you could feed your, your brain, your mind at Quincy Grammar, your, uh, your soul uh, at a number of churches, getting to those in just a minute, and also your hands. Uh, the Denison House, which some of you may be familiar with, was one of the early settlement houses uh, in uh, in the United States, modeled after the Hull House in Chicago, and that was founded in the 1890s, uh, uh, just also on Tyler Street, across from the Quincy Grammar School. Um, and you know, you you may be familiar with what a settlement house does. Basically, this was a place where middle class, often women volunteers would aid um, newly arrived immigrants um, with housing, with food, with, uh, with classes, with English uh, education, and so forth. And a couple of fun facts about the Denison House. Um, one is, many of you know Amelia Earhart, local, uh, uh, one of our local legends here, uh, was at one point the uh, director of the Syrian Mothers Club at the, at the Denison House, working directly with the Syrian uh, women um, who, who had recently arrived here. Another uh, well-known personality associated with this uh, site on our walk is uh, Khalil Gibran, um, who the famous poet, many of you may know the uh, plaque dedicated to him outside of the public library. And when he came to Boston uh, with his mother, uh, he took art classes at the Denison House. So there were quite a few interesting personalities. In Gibran's case, you know, that was kind of his entree into the bohemian art world, which uh, served him throughout his life and career. But uh, now we see ourselves looking here at the uh, St. George Orthodox Church, also on Tyler Street. Okay, great. So I'll just talk a little about faith in the community. So we may not have mentioned earlier, but almost everyone who happened to move to this community was Christian. There were also Muslims moving to Quincy Point, um, something we want to research more, but just in this neighborhood, everyone was pretty much uh, Syrian Orthodox, Melkite, or Maronite, so sects of Christianity that were, were common in, in Lebanon and Syria. Um, there were four churches within just a few blocks of each other on Hudson and Tyler Streets in the early 20th century. Um, St. George's, which you see here, was founded uh, in 1900 by Father George Malouf. This wasn't the original location, but um, one of its locations. And you can see it's on the right. 
It has kind of a more Eastern look with the domes and the, the Orthodox cross there. And people would go to these churches not just to speak their own language and worship, but also to you know, socially engage with other people, maybe find work, celebrate important holidays, uh, such as weddings and funerals. Um, and yeah, let's st start a family, go through the, the important stages of life. So among the other ways that uh, community was formed and, and reinforced uh, in the neighborhood was through civic organizations. And th this was a population of many, many civic organizations. We see them often associated with churches, um, and, and many also uh, women's organizations were among them. So here we see a wonderful photograph from the Lebanese and Syrian Ladies' Aid Association. This is the Armistice Day parade float, celebrating the anniversary of the armistice after World War I in 1925. Uh, and we can see them here dressed up uh, with, their, with their float. Um, so in, women you know, were engaged in this, uh, in this community Long after, long after the end uh, of World War I. We talked about that as a moment of political ferment. Um, but I'm now going to talk about the ways that the community came to um, disperse out of the neighborhoods that we talked about in Chinatown um, and along Shamit Avenue. Um, and, and here, too, we see uh, political engagement on the part of the residents of the neighborhood. They were actively uh, involved uh, in... Um, in advocating for a continued presence, even as uh, government um, policy made it harder and harder to stay. So why do we not see such a vibrant presence today um, in these neighborhoods? There are a few reasons. One, of course, is generational change. I know many of you here were part of, you know, had ancestors who were part uh, of this community and have ended up in various other parts of the city or the suburbs, uh, especially uh, West Roxbury, Norwood, Dedham, etc. Um, so there was certainly generational change uh, and a desire to uh, expand uh, to more space and so forth. Um, another reason though was urban change and um, we saw uh, today if you walk from Hudson or Tyler Street down to Shambut Avenue you find yourself in the midst of a lot of traffic. Uh, you have to cross over the uh, I-90, um, the highway, the Mass Pike and it, it's, it's a pretty stark shift from one side to the other. Um, this, the construction of the central artery of um, and, and then also in, eight, in 1957, the establishment of the Boston Redevelopment Authority, the BRA, had a significant impact on this neighborhood and many others in Boston. Uh, there were many uh, Syrian residents who advocated uh, for uh, more of a voice uh, in the BRA's plans for urban renewal. Um, and we see, for example, one of them commemorated uh, in Peters Park off of Shawmut and Bradford today. It's just Sadie Peters. So Sadie and George Peters were uh, from uh, Lebanon. So, but I will say there is some good news, I think. Um, just last month, the city of Boston, oh, here we go. Just last month, uh, the city of Boston won a grant from the uh, Department of Transportation to uh, reconnect Chinatown. So um, they're going to be, over the coming years, uh, building over um, and connecting the neighborhoods that we've been talking about um, using um, uh, using this uh, funding. So it's a $2.5 million project. Last slide. Uh, we are also announcing here that we have a grant from the Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library to make our tour virtual. So we will be using their wonderful Atlas Scope tool that you can use on your own to compare, you know, base and overlay maps. These are um, the overlay map uh, are old fire insurance records, um, so, and they have property names, and you will see those, also a few of them, um, upstairs in the exhibition, and we encourage you to write on the note cards we provided um, any um, addresses or memories you have of the neighborhood to help us build this tour, um, so you can compare what Boston looks like today to um, any map they have from the 19th century up to 1938, so you can cheat. See Arab names like Hajj, Shibli, George, uh, Homsi uh, as well. So that's one direction our uh, project is headed. Uh, we also were featured recently, the project was featured in a podcast through Harvard Islamica podcast. 
and we published an article in Arabic and in English uh, in Jumhuria, so we wanted it to be accessible to a wide range of people. Um, and you know, check out the exhibit upstairs, and hopefully we can move it to another location uh, in the future. Yeah. Um, so as we said, well, much of what's, what was once Boston's Little Syria is not as visible today as it once was. You know, Little Syria still, in a sense, exists in a different and more dispersed form and uh, with the community members who carry uh, these memories with them uh, out to uh, where they now live. So we're pleased to introduce today's panelists who will tell you more about how and why their families came to Boston and what life was like for the Syrians who settled here. Uh, we're very pleased to introduce them now and I think to welcome them up to the uh, podium. All right, great. So I'll introduce everybody. So on, I think, your left, um, Ed Malouf is an exhibit de developer and graphic designer. He's the principal at Content Design LLC. Uh, in the middle, we have Nick Haddad. Um, he has degrees in engineering and education. After working briefly as a structural engineer, he changed careers and spent the next 48 years as an educator, working first as a classroom teacher, and later doing science curriculum research and development he retired in 2019. Uh, Richard Shibley was born in the south end of okay, uh, south end of Boston to a Lebanese American father and a Greek American mother. He attended Boston Public Schools, uh, Boston Latin School, and Harvard College. Uh, he worked for many years in government and public service. Um, he was also an active member of the Arab American Institute. Um, serving the Democratic Party as a delegate to many state conventions um, and as a party officer and served as the chairman of Boston Ward 9 Democratic Committee. Um, after that, he earned an MBA from Boston University before embarking on a career in information technology consulting and training, uh, which he uh, continues as a, in a senior position at Boston Medical Center's IT department. So we will have a few questions for them to start the roundtable and discussion. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so the first question uh, for all of you in this case um, is to, we'd like each of you to give us a general introduction to your family's story um, in Syria and Lebanon coming to the U.S. Uh, and Upton today. Uh, where did your family live and work um, and how uh, and and how do you connect uh, with that history? Maybe we could start with uh, Ed and Nick and uh, Richard, if that makes sense. We'll move from right to left. Thank you very much. Hello? Yes, uh, Mahaba. Um, yeah, my great-great-grandfather, George Maloof, um, came over twice, I've been told, um, first to scout around, and then the second time officially with um, his wife, Rashidi, and his sister, Sadie, I believe. He had several sisters. Um, they arrived here in 1907. Um, he was a cobbler by trade. Uh, my aunt recalls that whenever she got a new pair of shoes, um, she had to go upstairs and show them to him where he would criticize the workmanship. <laughs> <laughs> so he was, he, uh, they came here um, and settled in the South End in 1907, but then shortly thereafter, they followed, I guess, his sister out to, she found somebody who got married, they went out to Ogden, Utah. They took a train, none, none, none of this, you know, wagon train nonsense or anything like that. So I have an uncle, Tufi, uh, my grandfather's brother, who has a Ogden, Utah, you know, birth certificate, which is kind of cool. But that didn't last very long. Um, the folks, the Maloofs, I guess Sadie Maloof married another Maloof, they became the Western Maloofs on, in, the, in California. Um, so they, uh, but my, I'm told that, uh, you know, my great, great grandfather just wanted to have a nice house and a yard. And so they returned, took the train back to um, the South End and resided at 30 Hudson Street. Uh, for a short period of time before they um, moved on to, um, in 1917, they, they had purchased property in West Roxbury, um, and they had a house built, like a um, two-family with an attic house. Three families eventually lived there. But they used to go out on the weekends to um, dynamite and clear the land on their own. 
but then they hired builders, um, which is, I mean, I can't believe that, it, that I don't know. He worked in the, uh, the hood factory, um, in the hood rubber factory in Watertown. So that must have been quite a commute back then. Um, but then, you know, they built the house in Versailles Street, and so most of my research and, and stories are around they're moving, in, and they said that, like, everybody came from uh, the old neighborhood into West Roxbury, and so it, it you know, still is a bit of a, a Lebanese um, Syrian ghetto. But that is um, sort of our connection between the um, South End and, um, and West Roxbury. Dad, um, all four of my grandparents came from Mount Lebanon uh, between 1890 and 1910. Um, both of my grandmothers came with family. They came with their parents and some siblings. Um, and both of my grandfathers came here on their own as older teens. Um, and they all ended up eventually in the South Cove neighborhood in Boston. It was a, wasn't a straight line. Um, they, uh, one of my grandmothers actually, the, the Corey family uh, on my mother's side uh, ended up in North Carolina uh, initially. The other three came to Boston. Uh, they traveled from Boston. My, my great grandfather on my father's side, one of them um, went to British Columbia, uh, before he came back to Boston, went down to Winston, Connecticut, where there was another Middle Eastern uh, community, uh, got married in Winston and came back to uh, the South Cove area. Um, so that's uh, three of my grandparents were actually born in Baruch, a uh, village uh, east of Beirut, up in the mountains. My mother's father had a store uh, on the corner of Hudson and Harvard Streets. Uh, import, uh, Middle Eastern import store. And I remember going in there as a child, being fascinated by the line of barrels full of olives on one side and the uh, refrigerated case with lamb on the other side and the smell of spices uh, in the store. Uh, wonderful child. I never lived in the South Cove neighborhood myself, but visiting my grandfather and my cousins who lived up above the store, uh, was my experience in South Cove. Um, when the expressway went through and the, and the neighborhood got more dispersed, um, the family ended up in West Roxbury. Uh, my family did. Uh, and before, even before that, my, uh, my father's, my mother's family moved out to West Roxbury. So West Roxbury was another place where the people gathered. Uh, that's uh, my grandfather, one of my grandfathers was a cobbler. The other one was the, at the grocery store. Um, I guess that was a story of my uh, my family coming here. Well, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I, I, I just want to thank the Massachusetts Historical Society for hosting this event um, uh, and the lovely exhibit upstairs on uh, Little Syria. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Lydia Harrington and Chloe Borderwick for their interest in our heritage and the tremendous amount of work that they have put into this project. <laughs> I'm, I'm particularly grateful to uh, Lydia and Chloe for bringing attention to our history. It, it, my mother's side is Greek. And in, in contrast uh, to that side of the family who insisted that I learn the language, they, they sent me to Greek school, um, my, my Arabic speaking relatives uh, use their mother tongue as a way of concealing their business from us children. <laughs> and as a result, I'm fluent in Greek and speak virtually no Arabic. Um, and um, I, I, I believe that this type of dissimulation or takia is common in our community. Um, this is not surprising after centuries of religious persecution in the Ottoman Empire and successor states. Even here in the United States, after the Arab oil embargo of the 1970s, the Kuwait War in the 1990s, 9-11, the Iraq War, and other events in the Middle East. Many of us just don't feel comfortable advertising our heritage for fear of uh, persecution and, and discrimination. Um, my grandparents were born in what was then Syria, a member of the Ottoman Empire that dominated the Eastern Mediterranean for centuries. My grandfather, my Jiddu, Musa Khalil Shibli, Moses Khalil Shibli, came from Shlifa, near the Bekaa Valley, 
my grandmother, a situ, Emma Abraham, was from Duma. Now, they actually met briefly in a camel caravan in the old country. And uh, a decade later, were reacquainted here and married in 1902. Uh, I, uh, according to the family history, they, um, they had their honeymoon by taking a streetcar to Charlestown. Um, <laughs> They first lived in what is now and, and what was then Chinatown at 38 Edinburgh Street, a building that was demolished decades ago to make way for the central artery. Chinatown and Syriatown overlapped. Uh, my grandfather was a peddler um, and eventually was able to open a dry goods store nearby at 55 Beach Street, where a Chinese restaurant is now located. A as the family grew with the arrival of my uncle Khalil or Charlie, uh, my father Frederick, and my aunt Khadra, or Gladys, the family moved to an apartment upstairs from the store. And by all accounts, uh, the Chinese and Syrian communities lived side by side in what was a warm and, and friendly um, community. Um, my, my aunt Gladys um, actually wrote a book um, titled True Love Stories. And uh, if I just uh, read the, uh, the first couple of sentences of Auntie Gladys's book, um, titled Boston's Little Lebanon. Living in Boston in the early 1900s was like living in Lebanon or Syria. This square mile colony flanked by Essex Street in the north, Broadway on the south, Harrison Avenue on the west, and Albany Street on the east was exclusively Arab territory, where people prouded themselves on their ability to function within the culture of mainstream America while clinging tenaciously to their own ethnic roots and traditions. Thank you, Auntie Gladys. On the evening of March 9th, 1913, while my family was eating their Sunday supper, they heard a loud bang outside. Going downstairs, they discovered a dead body on the front steps a victim of the Tong Wars that raged in Boston and in China in those years. It was the top story on page one of the Boston Post the next day. My grandfather was so alarmed by this event that he moved the family to the remote West Roxbury neighborhood of Boston. Uh, but finding the hour-long commute by streetcar too much, Jidu and Situ bought a house at 287 Shamit Avenue in the South End around 1917. My dad attended the Quincy School, a picture of which we just saw a few minutes ago, from which he was graduated in 1920. Uh, two decades later, they moved to 40 Union Park, where I lived for the first couple of years of my life. Uh, I'm still in the South End on Rutland Street in a building my dad originally bought in 1948 to house the offices of his newspaper, uh, the Midtown Journal. is could you talk about one specific object in the exhibition and its place in your family? So we'd like Ed to focus on the photographs um, and the Fez, uh, Richard on Midtown Journal, and Nick on your grandmother's lease. So. Well, certainly. So the uh, photograph that's in the exhibit is of my uh, great-grandfather, George and, uh, Rashidi, and uh, my grandfather, uh, my, my, my Jiddu, um, uh, Frederick and my aunt Jackie and Aunt Louise, and the three of the three of them, they made the they were the you know it was like kind of like their arrival portrait, right? You could see the uh, the, the backdrop behind them, and um, they look very um, like they've arrived. You know, they like they're doing very very well. Um, my grandfather be, uh, became a furniture refinisher. Um, he went to uh, Boston Trade, and I believe my great my great uncle Tufi did as well and my aunt went I think she went to the, the Boston high schools but um, yeah that photograph is every every member of the family has that photograph um, and um, you know those formal portraits you know I don't see don't always see people getting them done these days and I see there's a great value to them because it's like a good quality image um, the fez I've been trying to find out the origin of the fez um, there's a picture of my great, great, great grandfather um, in Zahali wearing one, and it's he was a shopkeeper in Zahali. Um, unfortunately, when my 
family came, my great-great-grandfather came over, uh, my great-grandfather came over, they did not ever go back to Lebanon. I don't know if that was the experience with uh, your families. Was there ever, like, not a going back? Just for a visit. Well, maybe there was a, a visit. Yeah, didn't have a visit. Hardly. There was, apparently, my great-grandfather, uh, George, did have books in Arabic. Um, and I think he corresponded with his far-flung sisters, but there's never any mention of the, that family. But anyways, there's a picture of a Fez on my great, great, great grandfather. And that one, that the two that I have, apparently were brought back by one of my uncle, my uncle John, perhaps, um, during one of his tra to a travel in Turkey. Because that's where you'd get one. Um, and so that, um, it's kind of a neat hat. You know, the origins of it, it was the Ottoman Empire wanted to have a headpiece. I mean, you, may, you know, people may want to catch it. That was different than an existing type of turban that was more available for more people or something. But I don't know if my great-grandfather ever wore one. It's just one of those things. Thank you. Um, there's a piece of lace that's framed uh, in the exhibit. Maybe you saw that. Um, I discovered it after my parents, both the parents had passed away, and it was in a, a linen chest in my parents' home. Uh, hadn't seen the light of day in a long time, I suppose, um, but I thought it was beautiful and made a frame, had a frame for it, and uh, have had it hanging up in the house. Uh, shortly after I discovered it, I took a picture of it and sent it to a bunch of cousins and sort of surprised to hear back from several of them who said, oh, we have, one, we have one too, we have one too, we have one too. So it was my mother's mother, uh, Selma Corey, uh, who had done that lace work, that needlework, I guess it's called. Um, she did raise six children, and she worked in the family store, and she died quite young, actually, but uh, I guess she found time to do the needlework. And uh, we have a little gang of, uh, gra of grandchildren now who... Uh, who treasure that, that, that kind of uh, work. Uh, Chloe mentioned um, uh, uh, my, uh, my father's newspaper, the Midtown Journal. <clears throat> it was uh, founded in uh, 1938. Um, uh, this was not a traditional uh, trade uh, for someone in our community. My, uh, my uncle, Charlie, had a dressmaking business. My auntie Gladys was a school teacher, uh, but dad, um, who, well, <clears throat> I hesitate to mention this, but it's really a matter of public record at this point. Um, after, after serving a few years um, in Concord State Prison uh, for uh, driving the getaway car in a bank robbery, um, <clears throat> uh, my father uh, found his career options limited, uh, so he, uh, <laughs> he started, uh, he's founded a newspaper. Um, and uh, after about seven years, he compiled some of the best uh, columns and stories uh, into a book called Reeling Around, uh, which you uh, saw upstairs, published under the pseudonym Iben Snoopin. Um, and uh, it's sort of a double entendre because Ibn uh, is uh, the, uh, the Arabic word uh, for son. Uh, a son, you know, a, a, a child, son, as opposed to the sun in the sky. Um, so, uh, uh, and uh, as time went on, of course, uh, things changed. One of the struggles uh, that divided Boston in the second half of the 20th century was urban renewal or, or slum clearance. And huge areas of the city were seized uh, uh, by uh, City Hall using eminent domain and, 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 and demolished. Entire neighborhoods, um, as uh, has been mentioned earlier, uh, such as the New York Streets area, the West End, uh, Castle Square, Scully Square, uh, and the Southwest Corridor disappeared and residents were uh, displaced and, and scattered. And the construction of highways such as the Central Artery and the, and the Massachusetts Turnpike impinged on the tiny area that was uh, Little Syria, or, or, or sometimes called Syria Town. Um, now, the Midtown Journal saw its circulation decline in those years due not only to the departure of its readers from the city, but also uh, the destruction of the mom and pop stores that uh, sold many of the newspapers. In the last years of its existence, uh, my father, um, uh, published um, a one-page, uh, page one column uh, titled You Care, with editorials um, like this one that uh, bashed uh, Mayor John Collins and the, uh, the Boston uh, Redevelopment Authority, or BRA, uh, for their uh, cynical destruction 
um, of, uh, of many uh, communities. Uh, so um, uh, if, I, if I may, um, in, the, in the 40s uh, and the 50s, many Lebanese and Syrian immigrants started to move out of the South End, um, which was an economically uh, depressed area with a, with a rising crime rate. Uh, Lebanese and Syrian families who owned property uh, considered themselves fortunate to be able to sell buildings for twenty-five or fifty thousand dollars. Buildings that today go for several million. Uh, members of the community migrated in a southwesterly direction to neighborhoods such as West Roxbury, where I still have a cousin, um, Rosendale, and to towns like Dedham, Westwood, and, and Norwood. And the churches followed their congregations. St. George's um, Antiochian Orthodox Church, a, a picture of which. Uh, we saw earlier, moved from um, its spot on uh, Tyler Street um, in Syria Town to St. George Street in the South End, where it stood when I was baptized there, um, and then to West Roxbury, uh, where it stands today. Uh, the St. John of Damascus Church, also I think on Hudson Street, um, is now located in Dedham, where my cousin, uh, uh, Father John Tabaji, uh, is the longtime pastor. Um, so now very few of us uh, remain in the old neighborhood. But thank you. We have a number of questions ourselves that we would still, of course, uh, be happy to ask, particularly about the connection between, you know, uh, the earlier waves of immigrants and uh, um, and yourself and newer waves, as well as between um, uh, the descendants and families back in Syria and Lebanon today. Uh, as, and we're also interested, of course, in what you all think uh, in your own contribution. So we would like to actually turn the floor over to the audience to pose questions now to our uh, panelists and feel free to you know add and elaborate um, at, at leisure here uh, on on your responses. So I know there are a number of questions. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, gentlemen. It's very interesting. Why West Roxbury? I don't know who was first. Um, I know that um, somehow uh, my, my grandfather ended up going there. It's about as far as you can go down Washington Street in, before you leave the city of Boston. Um, and uh, he built a house on what was then called DeSoto Road, and now known as, um, excuse me, what was then known as Hinsdale Road, today DeSoto Road. Um, I don't know why, uh, but, but that's where he was just for a few years after that murder on the front steps and then came back to the South End. You know, I was looking at a map um, of West Roxbury from 1907, and you can see, it's, it looks very built up, but that area where on Vershire Street and Cowling Street, all the lines were dashed in like it was all under construction. It was a brand new development. So it was the last bit of place, you know, wild land that you could get. But at the time, my Uncle George, um, like in the 40, or the late 40s, he could still go out there and go hunting with a 22 rifle. We have a picture of him. So you get some squirrels, and actually he'd bring some squirrels or birds home, and um, Situ would cut them up and prepare them for meals. When my parents uh, moved out of the South End and uh, bought a little house in West Roxbury on Swan Street, just close to Washington, um, they ended up being surrounded by people that they had grown up with on Hudson and Tyler Street and Harvard Street. It was really moving to me to find out that they've been, they're surrounded by people they've known all their lives. Uh, um, I was really interested in a photograph that was shown of uh, women on Armistice Day. Um, and years ago, I had a woman who worked for me, and she, her father was Iranian, and she referred to him as the Ayatollah because he was had a r rather traditional view of um, women's roles. So I was kind of interested to see that at, in the early part of the 20th century, um, women were taking such an active political role. And I was wondering if people could comment on that. Was that typical? Well, my mother wanted to go to college, and her father said, that's not what women do. Um, so that, that was, you know, that was her experience. Okay, so my, it's my turn. Yeah, my uh, grandmother, Situ, um, she, uh, the family owned um, several buildings in the South End in those days. They were mostly tenement houses, and um, uh, you did not want to cross my grandmother. She was, she was in charge, no question about it. 
Yeah, my Aunt Jackie was the first of the family. She was, of course, a, a first generation uh, born on this soil. But, and her mother was Irish, by the way. Um, all my uncles, my, not myself, but my, many, they all married Irish women. Just, just a pattern we saw. But she was the first to go to college. And she said that she had gone to high school, um, came out, was going to be a typist. That was her plan. And then after about a year or six months into it, working um, uh, in, um, in the old Goody Clancy building or whatever near um, Public Arts, she just thought, wow, these four walls, not for me. So she told her parents she wanted to go to college. And they had whatever. She also told me that, you know, once a Maloof gets something in their mind, you don't try to get around it. And so she saved up the money and then went to uh, Emmanuel and became a French teacher in the Boston public school system for many years. One more quick note about the, the women in my family. My mother's, one of my mother's first cousins, um, Rosie LaCour's, uh, was the first female cab driver in Boston. She was, she was uh, stationed at South Station. She had a cab at South Station for many decades. Uh. That's impressive. <laughs> well, I am, I am from Spain, so I probably carry Umayyad blood inside. That's what I can say. But I have two types of questions. One very simple, and these are addressed to the presentation we had at the beginning. And it's about the Arax market where I buy. And this one is on Montauburn. And I know Jakub, and I know all the family. Is it the same Arax ma no. no. Different generation, different family. OK. So thank you. And then uh, you both mentioned other communities that settle in Mexico, in Brazil, Bolivia, Argentina. And I have visited them. I know the clubs. They are luxurious. They have foundations, even for the sick. And I don't see that here in Boston. You know, the way that these clubs are, and you know, they also they are owners of factories, still in Mexico, in Monterrey, they are owners of textile factories, for example. So how can you explain why we do not have those expressions of power here in Boston? Why don't we know more about the heritage of the Syrians and the Lebanese in Boston? I, because in Brazil, we know they have a publishing house where they publish poetry, literature. And it, I mean, you can go to, to, to a library, to a bookshop, and you find them there. If you go here to the, I don't know, the, what is it called, the Harvard Bookstore, and you ask for something in Arabic, they don't have it. They don't have literature from Argentina, written by Syrians, and so on. So how can you explain to me why the community here didn't project as they did in Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico, to mention some examples? Well, I am, I am from Spain, so I probably carry Umayyad blood inside. That's what I can say. But I have two types of questions. One very simple, and these are addressed to the presentation we had at the beginning. And it's about the Arax market, where I buy. And this one is on Montauburn. And I know Jakub, and I know all the family. Is it the same Arax? No. no. Different generation, different family. OK, so thank you. And then uh, you both mentioned other communities that settle in Mexico, in Brazil, Bolivia, Argentina. And I have visited them. I know the clubs. They are luxurious. They have foundations, even for the sick. And I don't see that here in Boston. You know, the way that these clubs are, and you know, they also they are owners of factories, still in Mexico, in Monterrey, they are owners of textile factories, for example. So how can you explain why we do not have those expressions of power here in Boston? Why don't we know more about the heritage of the Syrians and the Lebanese in Boston? I, because in Brazil, we know they have a publishing house where they publish poetry, literature. And it, I mean, you can go to, to, to a library, to a bookshop, and you find them there. If you go here to the, I don't know, the, what is it called, the Harvard Bookstore, and you ask for something in Arabic, they don't have it. They don't have literature from Argentina, written by Syrians, and so on. So how can you explain to me why 
the community here didn't project as they did in Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico, to mention some examples. Well, I guess mainly they were a lot like my, um, uh, my great-grandfather. He just wanted to have his house, his garden. He spent his uh, time when he retired sitting on his back porch smoking his nagili, and he had like a string, went out to the mulberry tree to keep the birds off. Um, no, uh, as far as my family, I, my father was involved in things, but he never could you know, share wealth, but they weren't very, um, you know, it was just family and community. know it's true that you know the populations were different sizes uh, many cities I mean Boston's was large for the United States but um, uh, it, it did disperse you know um, into the suburbs but I would say actually that you do see quite a lot of expressions of uh, certainly even coming from the earlier generations and absolutely today uh, of economic success yes and also but intellectual and literary life I mean there was, um, you know, quite a vibrant, uh, as I said, civic, uh, civic scene. I mean, women's organizations, to speak to the other question, um, as well as uh, political associations, the Syrian American Club, for example, just being just one, the Lebanese uh, Syrian Ladies Aid Society being another. Um, and, um, you know, we mentioned Khalil Gibran, but he was one of just only, um, he was one of many, actually, who were, uh, prolific uh, writers, poets, artists, etc. So I think the problem is more that they're not um, perhaps better known, not that they didn't exist. And I think one of the main goals of this project has been to uh, bring those stories more to the surface. I, I think that having the Greek blood mixed with the Arab blood gives me an interesting perspective on history because both countries, Syria and Greece, were under the Ottoman Empire for centuries. Uh, and uh, this was a, a Muslim empire. Um, my ancestors were Christians, and we just kind of kept our heads down. And this is something that um, was passed down from generation uh, to generation. When, when my grandfather uh, uh, came to America, and he actually arrived on July 4th, 1896, the 120th anniversary of the signing of Declaration of, of Independence, he was ineligible to apply for citizenship. This is something that I learned from Lydia and Chloe from their study of, of history. Um, uh, um, white Europeans were entitled to apply for citizenship, as were um, uh, blacks from Africa, uh, as a result of uh, laws passed during uh, uh, the Reconstruction after the Civil War. But because we were in Asia, uh, we were not considered um, white enough to apply until uh, the uh, decision of um, U.S. versus Dow, which was decided, what, 1915? 1915. Uh, so I'm, I'm a litigation Caucasian. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I definitely think that a history of discrimination and xenophobia has to do with how visible the history has been. Sorry. Um, so actually my question, my name is Lydia and I work for a, an organization in Chinatown, the Chinatown Community Land Trust, which is working on developing an immigrant history trail. And we would really love to have some part, some points of the immigrant history trail um, reflecting the history of little Syria. So I just really want to thank um, you all for speaking and, and everybody for the program today, which I really um, learned a lot and invite anyone who would like to share photograph, old photographs, interview, be interviewed or share an interview you may have done, et cetera, um, for that trail to you know, contact me. And also if you had, I just wanted to ask um, our panelists if you had to pick a couple of points um, in the Chinatown area today um, that to be markers in the immigrant history trail, what would you pick? Hmm. Uh, don't know that I have a point, but I, I will uh, agree with um, Richard, who talked about the relationship between the two communities. My parents and the, were very, had lots of friends, and uh, in the Chinese community, I thought there was just a lot of, of intermingling of uh, friends and business, and. 
uh, it seemed like a, a a nice situation. I mean, that's that's what I've heard. Um, I think as far as locations on our tour with um, Chloe and Lydia, that we had stops, and um, I can remember specifically some of those locations would be worthy of a plaque or uh, some sort of informational panel or something like that. But that's uh, awesome that you're, and I swear we ran into you during that tour. I'm not sure. But we ran into some people. We had some uh, extended conversations. Um, but uh, all, the, all the power to you to help develop that. Um, I, uh, in terms of location of markers, um, uh, uh, I think the, um, the side of Hudson Street that is no longer there, that was wiped out, um, was the site of one or two of our churches. Um, I mentioned my cousin, who's a pastor of St. John of Damascus Church, uh, was hoping uh, to uh, uh, convince the city to put up a marker for, for that um, institution. Uh, and I'm happy to talk to you after. The answers to your question, I don't have a specific answer, but it, it comes in waves. Um, my grandparents were immigrants from Lebanon, and they came to the South End, then to Worcester, then we settled in the Berkshires. And we've had strong clubs in the different places. They come and they go. Um, you know, the, the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee is a landmark civil rights institution in Washington. And at various points, some of us in the room have run chapters here in Boston. Um, it's active for 10 years, and then it fades. And then there's a new world crisis, and it becomes active again, and then it fades. We have, I'm with Catherine Hanna, who's the founder of the Palestine Film Festival. Uh, we have an Arab cultural center that's relatively new. I'm, I'm asking the question of myself, is part of the problem. We don't ever have physical buildings that we buy and set up, so we don't ever physically mark a permanency. So it's an interesting question to explore more, not why aren't they in existence, but why do we have them for a while, and then why do they fade away? I think that's a really good for us as a community to figure out why. There was a a community that, um, I guess it's faded away. Yeah, it did fade away. It wasn't political, it was just cultural, social. Uh, three of my four grandparents came from the village of Baruch uh, in the mountains. And uh, there was a large community of, of Lebanese from Baruch. Every summer, when I was a young child, there was a Baruch outing. The whole community gathered and uh, you know, there were probably a couple of hundred people from the, the village of Baruch. Uh, they had cultural, you know, they just wanted to be together. But, you know, as I grow, grew older, um, our lives weren't focused so much on where, we, where the, the village where our grandparents came from. We all, my, my cousins and I, most of us went to college. We, we weren't as connected to the Baruchis. So I think, you know, it was one of those waves. People came here from Baruch. They wanted to get together. There's another one of the photographs in the exhibit is another community, probably from the, either from St. George's Church or one of the villages. Um, but I think they, you know, as time goes by, people's perspectives broaden, they, their connections broaden, and uh, you sort of lose that, that sort of community strength that was there for a while. Well, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Bordewick uh, and Dr. Harrington. Uh, I want to thank our panelists, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming. I hope you uh, enjoyed the program and the uh, temporary exhibition we had. Um, have a wonderful night.